Hi everyone, my name is Sharice Hill, formerly Sharice Hughes Oliver, and today I'll be talking a little bit about my dissertation research titled The Impact of Race on Movement Mechanics. So first, just a little bit about me. I recently completed my PhD in biomedical engineering at Virginia Tech under Dr. Robin Queen, and I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow in bioengineering within the Clemson Medical University of South Carolina bioengineering program. So when I think about biomechanics research, I think about there being a pretty high impact potential. We have the ability to impact both clinical care and athletic performance with our research. And in my opinion, with that high impact potential comes a real responsibility to make sure that we're conducting research that enables an equitable research impact. And what I mean by equitable research impact is that our research positively impacts as many people and as many subgroups within the population as possible and also impacts those individuals as they need it. So if there are particular groups that are affected by current health disparities, for example, then I believe that biomechanics research should also address those groups in order to help understand and better explain those health disparities and give a bit of extra attention to those populations. When we think about biomechanics literature, some of the foundational literature, actually quite a bit of the foundational literature was based in military populations, which if we picture the military populations, it's not the most heterogeneous group, but they are a large and convenient sample population to pull from. However, after that foundational literature was set, there was really a need to question some of the assumptions that went into that foundational literature and maximize generalizability of those research findings. So we then started to see literature trying to understand how different factors like age, pathology, and sex impact movement, and how each of these factors need to be considered in biomechanics research, study design, and translation of research findings. So, each of these factors, and among many others, have been found to significantly impact movement, which begs the question of what other factors also impact movement that maybe we haven't started to consider intentionally in biomechanics research yet. And one factor that I found particularly interesting is race. So I am an African-American woman, and when I started graduate school, I happen to you know look for myself being represented represented sorry in uh, the field of research that I was stepping into so as I just mentioned there was some research that did look at impacts of sex on movement and so in that sense I found myself to be pretty well represented within the body of literature uh, but that other important aspect of my identity and my being African-American I didn't really see represented and I wasn't sure as an early grad student, whether that was because we knew that race didn't impact movement or if uh, we just hadn't really addressed the question yet. And it turns out what I found is that race was rarely a factor of interest in biomechanics studies and was also rarely reported in biomechanics papers. So it was hard to even get an idea of how diverse different study samples were and to really get an answer to the question of whether race may impact movement in some way, which I find really interesting because there are pretty well documented racial health disparities and lots of musculoskeletal injuries and diseases. And I've listed a few here on the slide, um, but a few of them are uh, the incidence and prevalence of both knee and hip osteoarthritis, as well as other forms of osteoarthritis outside of the lower extremities, uh, tendon rupture, stress fractures, and even fall risk in older adults. So this is kind of a brief uh, set of literature that has intentionally looked at race as a factor of interest in a biomechanics study. And you'll notice that the list is not super long. <laughs> and that's because there haven't been a ton of studies that have looked at this question. So the previous literature is pretty slim in this area. 
There have been a few studies that found slower self-selected walking speed in African Americans compared to white Americans, although all of these studies focus on middle-aged and older-aged adults. Um, in knee osteoarthritis patients, African Americans were found to have more limited knee range of motion, smaller loading rates, and longer time to peak vertical ground reaction force. And walking speed and loading rate were both found to differ between Caucasian and Chinese women in one study. Another study comparing Korean people versus Western people found differences in walking speed, stride length, knee abduction moment, and sagittal plane hip, knee, and ankle moments. Uh, but that's pretty much it. There are a few other studies that touch on uh, different aspects that contribute to biomechanical variables. There are quite a few studies that look at uh, things like muscular tissue, force velocity curves, those types of questions. Um, but directly looking at large scale biomechanics, there isn't much there quite yet. And another thing that I found interesting when looking through this literature was that Every single study that I could find that intentionally included race as a primary factor of interest in the biomechanics research study did find some significant racial difference. And that really kept the wheels turning for me in terms of, you know, maybe this isn't an area worthy of further consideration. And the more I thought about it, this was kind of my rationale for continuing to look into this more. Um, if we know that movement mechanics are related to risk of musculoskeletal injuries and diseases, and we know that there are significant health disparities in those areas, is it possible that there are also differences between racial groups in movement mechanics that could be contributing to those health disparities that we're observing? If so, it would be really helpful for us to really understand how race impacts movement mechanics in order to translate that knowledge to help understand and mitigate those health disparities between racial groups. So at this point, I knew that this was kind of what I wanted to build my uh, dissertation research around. And naive me at that point was thinking, oh, this is a super straightforward question. I'll just get a population of different racial groups and gather a bunch of, you know, biomechanical variables, and then we'll just look at differences. Turns out it wasn't quite that simple. <laughs> there were lots of questions that uh, stepping into this study, we didn't quite uh, realize that we would need to wrestle with as much as we did. So I wanted to share a few of the questions that we tackled throughout the study design process with you guys. Um, I'll also note that this was a pretty lengthy process. We really took our time and wanted to make sure that we were going to be able to address this as well as we possibly, possibly could. So we spent a good eight months to a year um, consulting with lots of different professionals and in different areas of expertise to tackle tons of questions related to this study design. And I've only listed a few in the slides here. If you'd like to know more about uh, other questions that we wrestled with, feel free to reach out to me personally, and I can absolutely share more information with you. So one of the questions that we had to tackle pretty early on was whether we were interested in race, ethnicity, or race slash ethnicity. A lot of prior studies had used this term race slash ethnicity without really defining um, what that term meant or what either of those terms mean. And they do differ. Um, race tends to refer more to um, social categorizations based on some type of physical attributes or characteristics um, and is more closely related to things like region of origin, whereas ethnicity is more culturally based. So when we think of racial groups versus ethnicities, to give you guys an example, African American and white American, those are races, or black and white, those are races, whereas Hispanic and not Hispanic, those are ethnicities. So for our study, we chose to focus on race. Um, and we chose to focus on African Americans and white Americans here, just because the most well-documented 
health disparities were between these two groups. So we just thought that was a logical place to start. I would love to expand that to include lots more groups and to also incorporate ethnicity in the future, but that just wasn't feasible for a dissertation study. Um, another thing that I want to note super quickly is that the terminology here we actually found to be more of a decision than we thought it was going to be. Um, we had a lot of discussions with uh, one of our collaborators who ended up being on my um, dissertation team about whether we should use the terms black and white, African American, white American, of African descent and European descent, and, you know, what terminology should we use? Because if you think about it, each of those different terminologies can appeal to a different group of people. Those are not all equivalent. So conversations like that were uh, the ones that kind of came up as part of this study design process that we didn't really anticipate at the beginning. And what I've included here on the left are um, some bullet points of kind of an operational definition that we decided to, to use for the purposes of this study. So just so that you know what I'm meaning when I refer to this thing that is race, um, I'm referring to it as a social cultural categorization that's not based on any single characteristic, trait, or gene. Race is not biologic or genetic. Um, but it does impact people's lives, experiences, perceptions, and overall health. And we've chosen to define race based on self-identification, which is in line with how the U.S. Census Bureau does it. Another question that we had to tackle was what we hypothesized may cause racial differences. So I mentioned on the last slide that race is a social construct and that it's not strictly biologic or genetic. So we didn't hypothesize that if there were racial differences, they would be because of racial classification itself. But instead we hypothesized that there would be some underlying factors that uh, were driving observed racial differences in movement patterns. And uh, we figured there could be lots of different variables that could be kind of these underlying driving explanatory factors. Uh, for my dissertation, I, I chose three categories that I thought could impact movement mechanics, um, anthropometry, lower limb strength, and health status. And we've included independent variables within each of these groups within our study design to try to understand why racial differences may exist. Since, you know, as a social construct, we did not hypothesize that race in and of itself would cause differences in movement. Another question we had to tackle were what movements to analyze and what variables to include. So, um, as I alluded to earlier on, a lot of our long term motivations were health disparities, uh, which initially for us brought to mind a lot of clinically relevant biomechanical variables um, and a lot more complex measures. But what we found is that in trying to interpret those measures, we really didn't have the foundation that we needed to be able to meaningfully interpret those more complex downstream measures. So we decided to start with uh, variables that were fairly fundamental to um, movement patterns, particularly in gait. So first and foremost, we chose our primary outcome measure as self-selected walking speed. It's one of the simplest biomechanical outcome measures. We know that it has implications for both healthy and clinical populations. So we wanted that to be our starting point. And then we also included step length and width peak vertical ground reaction force, and peak hip extension angles, knee flexion angle, and ankle plantar flexion angles as well. Now, in addition to walking, we also wanted to include more complex tasks because we were curious whether the complexity of the task would elicit more or less racial differences, if we did see any at all. So we also chose to include running and landing and for these variables, we pretty directly um, did decide to choose variables that weren't too complex, weren't too far down the interpretive ladder, um, but also did have some type of clinical relevance since there are health disparities in um, 
things like stress fractures and tendon rupture risk as well. And um, there just weren't quite as many fundamental or super basic variables with running and landing as there were with gait. So we thought it would be a little bit more interesting for these more complex tasks to tie up more directly with um, clinically relevant measures. So in running, we looked at stance time, impact peak, vertical ground reaction force peak, average and maximum instantaneous loading rates, and peak knee flexion and hip adduction angles. In landing, we looked at impact peak, peak vertical ground reaction force, again, average and maximum instantaneous loading rates, impulse, peak knee flexion angle, peak knee abduction angle, and frontal plane knee range of motion. And now the last set of questions uh, that I'll talk about, again, there were many more, um, was this question of how do we actually do this? <laughs> um, how many people do we need? And what statistical analysis would be appropriate to answer the questions that we had? Um, so with the sample size question, as I mentioned before, there really wasn't a ton of prior literature to inform our power analysis. And our primary outcome measure was self-selected walking speed. And we were wanting to focus on young adults and that data did not exist in the in the previous literature with a racial split between African Americans and white Americans in young adults looking at walking speed. Um, so we powered our we powered our study based on walking speed data from middle aged and older adults. So that's something to keep in mind and is a potential limitation. We're hoping that the data we've generated in this study will help others in their power analyses um, moving forward. We also had tons of discussions about what statistical analysis would be most appropriate. So we kind of had a multifaceted question here of one, whether there are racial differences in movement mechanics, and two, if there are racial differences, why do they exist? What factors are driving those racial differences? So I'll talk a little bit more um, later in the presentation about the statistical analysis that we chose, but I just wanted to place it here to make you aware that this was an extensive planning process um, that really did draw in lots of different uh, experts from outside of biomechanics. So speaking of the interdisciplinary team, I really just wanted to take a moment to let you guys know how interdisciplinary uh, my dissertation committee ended up being. And this is not everyone who contributed to the project. There was also um, a biostatistician who ended up being extremely influential in determining appropriate statistical analyses, as I was just talking about. Um, and she didn't sit on my committee. That's these six here. Um, there were tons of people who went into making this project possible. And these are just the, the six who you know, were the tried and true committee members who sat in on every single meeting. So my research advisor is Dr. Robin Queen on the left, who focuses on human biomechanics. We also had one other human biomechanist, Michael Madigan, and we had a comparative biomechanist who works with snakes and bugs, Jake Soha. Um, we also have Daniel Schmidt, who is an evolutionary anthropologist, Sean Arndt, who's an exercise physiologist, and Warney Reed, who's a sociologist. And very briefly, I just want to let you guys know how influential Dr. Reed was in making this study possible. He um, had experience in um, looking at different medical variables and health disparities and had extensive experience working with the social construct of race. So he was extremely influential in helping us navigate how to best incorporate race into our biomechanics research study and how to kind of navigate a lot of the questions of, you know, how do we facilitate meaningful discussion that both biomechanists and sociologists could participate in from this research study, what terminology is most appropriate, um, how, what specific words do we need to make sure to include versus avoid within our um, research papers, et cetera. 
Um, Daniel Schmidt was also very influential in having uh, super early on conversations with me, especially about how to conceptualize the study and really doing more than just identifying racial differences, but also seeking to understand why that, that might exist and um, really did a great job in kind of motivating the project group. So I, I really just want to underscore one more time how important it was for this study that we had such an interdisciplinary team that all brought very different voices and background to the committee discussions and to the study design. So that whole process brought us to the main purpose of wanting to identify and understand factors contributing to racial differences between African Americans and white Americans in movement mechanics. And for the purpose of this presentation, I'll focus on two aims. The first being to determine the impact of race on walking, running, and landing mechanics. And the second being the identification of factors potentially contributing to those racial differences in movement mechanics. So we recruited 92 participants with even splits by race and sex. Um, race, we again identified based on self-identification as either African-American or white American and sex as males or females. Um, our inclusion criteria were between 18 and 30 years old, the ability to walk without an assistive device and with no lower extremity injury in the past three months. Um, all participants came in for two study visits, a blood draw appointment and a testing session. Um, they started out the blood draw appointment with a 20 minute rest period to get them down to resting heart rate and blood pressure. And during that time, we collected demographic data, chronic and recent perceived stress questionnaires and Tegner activity level. At the end of the rest period, we collected resting heart rate and blood pressure and a certified phlebotomist drew 10 mils of venous blood, which we used to collect some uh, blood biomarker data. For the biomechanical testing session, we collected some anthropometric measures, also some lower extremity strength measures at, uh, of muscle groups surrounding hip, knee, and ankle, and I'll give you um, an indication of the specific measures that we collected here in a minute. And then we also completed a biomechanical assessment where participants completed seven trials in each condition, um, both regular and fast speed walking, which were 1.35 and 1.6 meters per second set speed, um, running, which was 3.2 meters per second, and landing, which was um, done using a drop vertical jump. We also collected the participant self-selected walking speed, of course, and the order of those conditions was randomized. Also, the order of the three main components there of the testing session were also randomized to try to prevent any order effects. So this is the full list of independent variables that we included. Um, again, they fit into those three explanatory categories that I defined earlier, anthropometry, strength, and health status. Again, um, I just want to make clear that we weren't thinking that these would be all of the variables that could potentially impact um, racial differences in movement mechanics, but they were a few that we thought might be interesting to start off with for the purpose of my dissertation. So the anthropometric measures we looked at were height, weight, BMI, waist circumference, waist hip ratio, curl index, which is the ratio of tibia length to femur length, and Q angle. For the strength measures, we looked at maximum hip abduction and adduction strength, knee extension and knee flexion strength, and ankle plantar flexion and dorsiflexion strength. And to measure those, we used a handheld dynamometer and um, a testing table along with a strapping protocol to try to get as close to isometric as possible. The health status measures, we collected heart rate and blood pressure using a digital blood pressure cuff. Um, blood glucose, C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and cortisol levels, along with chronic and recent perceived stress, which we got from questionnaires, and Tegner physical activity level. Um, this is the statistical analysis that after much discussion we ended up settling on. Um, it's divided into kind of two steps which correlate with the two aims. Um, on the left here, 
is the analysis that we use to get at uh, the first question of whether there were racial differences in movement mechanics. Now, we had quite a few measures, multiple conditions, so we wanted to avoid um, you know, errors that would result from just running a bunch of statistical tests. So we started off with multivariate ANOVAs and then ran all of our post hoc analyses within the MANOVA environment to avoid that error. Um, we included both race and sex because we were interested in whether there could potentially be some interactions. And then we followed up with appropriate post hoc univariate ANOVAs and students T pairwise comparisons we were prepared to run if we found any um, significant interactions. We ended up not finding any significant interactions. So moving forward from this, we stratified all of the data by sex and purely looked at racial differences. So on the right here is the statistical analysis that focused on that second aim of understanding why those racial differences that we observed in AIM-1 may exist. Um, so again, after stratifying the data by sex, we ran a stepwise linear regression model for each outcome measure that significantly differed between racial groups for that sex. Um, for each of these models, we um, included race as a locked predictor variable. And we observed the significance of race in that model before and after inclusion of other independent variables that were significantly correlated with the outcome measure. Um, how we interpreted from this was that if race was significant in the model before we added the independent variables and was still significant in the model after including correlated independent variables, then we interpreted that to mean that uh, those independent variables or the independent variables we included in this study were unable to explain the racial differences in that outcome measure. If, on the other hand, race was significant before we included those variables but was no longer significant after including those other independent variables, we then interpreted that to mean that those independent variables that remain in the model explained the racial effect on that outcome measure. So now to the fun part, to some results. Um, we did see faster self-selected walking speed in white Americans compared to African Americans, which does line up with uh, those previous studies who uh, all found similar results in middle-aged and older-aged adults. Now here is the uh, walking data. We have regular speed walking in the top row, fast speed walking in the bottom row. In the left column, we have the spatial variable, step length and step width. And on the right, we have the angular variables, hip extension, ankle plantar flexion, and knee flexion angles. So here we did not, um, or I haven't reported the kinetic variables because overall our kinetic MANOVA wasn't significant, so we didn't do any post hoc analyses there. So you can see from these figures that uh, we found larger peak ankle plantar flexion angles and hip extension angles in white Americans compared to African Americans. So looking at kind of the, the AIM-2 side of uh, walking, we looked at these explanatory factors, whether they could um, actually explain the racial differences that we observed in walking. Uh, we were able to explain the slower self-selected walking speed in African-American women using larger Q angle and weaker ankle dorsiflexion strength. So we found that um, Q angle and dorsiflexion strength explained away that racial effect on self-selected walking speed in women, but we weren't able to explain the racial differences in self-selected walking speed in men. Uh, we were also able to explain the smaller peak ankle plantar flexion angles in African-American women compared to white American women with weaker ankle plantar flexion strength. However, you can see here at the bottom that racial differences in self-selected walking speed, peak ankle plantar flexion angle, and peak hip extension angle in men could not be explained by the independent variables we included in this study. In running, we saw larger peak vertical ground reaction force, 
smaller peak hip adduction angle and longer stance times in African Americans compared to white Americans. Those first two results were significant only um, in men or irrelevant only for men. And the, the last measure of stance time difference was only in women. So whereas in walking, we were able to explain all of the racial differences, at least in women, we really weren't able to explain any of these racial differences in running very well at all, um, which was really interesting to us. It might just be that, you know, we weren't looking at the correct independent variables. Uh, it could also be that even in the case of walking, we weren't looking at the right variables for men, which is why we were able to explain for women and not for men. But in any case, the larger peak vertical ground reaction forces and smaller peak hip adduction angles in African American men compared to white American men, our models were completely unable to explain. Nothing stayed in the model at all. Um, longer stance times in African American women compared to white American women were partially explained by uh, higher resting heart rate and larger curl indices. Um, and by partially explain, I mean that it reduced the significance of race in the model, but that it was still statistically significant at our alpha level of 0.05. So that was only, that was interesting, but um, didn't give us quite as much confidence as, as the walking explanatory variables did. For landing, we saw larger peak vertical ground reaction forces and average and maximum instantaneous loading rates in men, in African American men compared to white American men. And we also saw larger frontal plane knee range of motion in African American women compared to white American women. Now for the explanatory variables or the explanatory factors for landing variables, again, the significant racial differences for men, we could not explain using the independent variables that we included in this study. Uh, larger frontal plane knee ranges of motion in African-American women compared to white American women were explained by larger weight and weaker knee extension strength. So overall, uh, kind of our main conclusions from the study were that Movement mechanics do differ between racial groups and are also impacted by sex. Um, our independent variables really were not powerful explanatory factors for the racial differences in men. Um, in women, they were much more impactful, except for in running, where we still weren't able to confidently uh, explain those racial effects. But we certainly did see both a set of racial differences and sex differences both in uh, the variables that were significantly different between racial groups and what explanatory factors were relevant. Um, from these study findings, we think it's really important to make sure that we're prioritizing racial diversity in study samples, which again is going to give us the tools to be able to work to maximize the equity of our research impact. If we don't have uh, biomechanics data from diverse populations, then it's really impossible for us to be able uh, to help work toward uh, more equity and reduce those health disparities in injuries and diseases that are very relevant to the biomechanics research population. Uh, we also thought it was interesting that both innate and modifiable explanatory variables were found. Um, from that, we thought, you know, it is important to make sure that you're considering innate metrics when interpreting data, especially since several of the innate metrics that we included in this study actually differed between racial groups, particularly in women. And we thought that since modifiable explanatory variables were also found, it created kind of an interesting possibility for targeted injury prevention and individualized rehab to potentially uh, be useful in addressing racial health disparities in injury incidence rates if we can intentionally um, target those, modifi those modifiable explanatory factors, excuse me, um, and hopefully be able to reduce racial differences and by extension, racial health disparities, which is an interesting hypothesis that came from this study that we'd like to build on at some point in the future.
So there are a few limitations here that I do want to at least briefly mention. Um, I mentioned earlier that we powered our study and sample size based on uh, middle-aged and older-aged adult self-selected walking speed data. And we ended up finding that we were underpowered for uh, detecting racial differences in some of our secondary and independent variables. That's something to keep in mind. Um, we also did strict categorization for racial groups as either African-American or white American. That was really by necessity, although it's still a limitation that should be taken into consideration with interpretation. Um, again, race is not genetic, so we couldn't have done categorization based on genetics. And it's also, um, it would also be inappropriate to do categorization based on researchers' perception of the participant. Um, so self-identification was really the best way to do so. And for the study design, we did need strict categorization as either African-American or white American. We also didn't require any running and landing sport experience, but we did have our participants do running and landing tasks. Um, the reason that we made this decision was because we wanted our study sample to be as representative of the general population as we could possibly get it to be. And um, we thought that if we required running and landing sport experience, we would end up with a much more tailored uh, study sample that wasn't as broadly representative of the study population. So that's something to keep in mind, especially when interpreting the running and landing data, that our running and landing data may not be as representative of the groups that would be at highest risk of having running and landing related injuries since they might not be performing those tasks as frequently. And lastly, um, there is also potential inaccuracy of the maximum strength measures. We did the best we could in trying to promote accuracy of those measures. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we did use a strapping protocol to try to restrict excess movement. We instructed the participants to try to um, restrict their movement to the intended motion path as much as they possibly could. Um, but there are always additional variables that could impact the accuracy of those measures, things like variable effort from the participants, which we couldn't control. Um, also things like, uh, quite frankly, my inability to perfectly counter, uh, particularly the participants' knee extension strength. Um, so that's just something to consider always, especially since we used um, a handheld dynamometer instead of a more stationary system to get those measurements. And really quickly, I just want to run through our main takeaways for this study. Um, first and foremost, race should be considered intentionally in biomechanics research. Disciplinarity or interdisciplinarity enables really appropriate integration of social constructs into biomechanics and other uh, fields of research that don't traditionally incorporate social constructs. Um, and really making sure that we're conducting biomechanics research within relevant social contexts is absolutely crucial. And interdisciplinarity within the study team really allows you to do that and to do that more confidently um, and make sure that you're doing it as appropriately as you can. Um, based on these findings, we do think that future research should continue exploring biomechanics of diverse populations in order to promote, again, equity of research translation, particularly uh, for clinical populations where the implications of that research translation are really, really important. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge everyone who made this study possible, my advisor, Dr. Robin Queen and the Granada Lab in general, um, Dr. Janet Reinhardt, who collected all of our blood samples, the Metabolic Phenotyping Corps at Virginia Tech for running all of our blood sample data, Dr. Laura Sands, who again helped with our statistical analysis, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Gilliam Fellowship for funding me during the study and IC at Virginia Tech uh, for also contributing funding toward the project. And super, super quickly, 
shameless plug, um, one of the publications that resulted from this study was just accepted for publication in the Journal of Biomechanics. So I've included the information here in case you want to read up more. Um, also, I've included my email address here. So feel free to reach out if you'd like to talk more about the um, study, if, there, if you are interested in particular details that I didn't cover here today. Thanks so much for listening.